hearing, please let us know because we're still refining this. But I want to welcome you this morning to our worship service. Good morning. Good morning, Carol. Good morning. Welcome to our morning worship service on Facebook Live and by conference call and in person. We're glad to have you here this morning. And uh, as we get started today, I want to invite those on Facebook to share comments if you wish to in the messages. And uh, those on the conference call line, if you could push star six, that would eliminate background noise so that uh, we don't have that going on during the service. Um, as we share our announcements this morning, I want to remind you that there will be an all-church meeting today at 1130 following this service to give updates on where we are with the bell tower and make some decisions about proceeding with the work on the bell tower in the next two phases. So if you're here in person, we welcome you. If you're a part of the church and you want to stay, you're welcome to stay. And if you're joining on Facebook, you can continue that way or on the conference call line. Uh, we also have a Zoom option. If people want to come in on Zoom, you got that information in the letter that went out this week. And then a reminder that we do have ballots that we're asking people to return to the church by this Friday, August the 7th, so that we can move forward with this project. Also, uh, there is an attendance link on the Facebook page for those that are joining that way. And uh, I invite you to fill that out this morning. And there is a question at the end of the link that I'm going to address in my sermon about uh, joining us for a prayer time on Thursday evenings at 7.30 during our regular devotion time. We're going to focus on prayer during that time. Um, also, um, I think Cara still has a link there with a survey for moving forward with education and Sunday school. If you haven't had a chance to go and fill that out, please do that because that gives us some good feedback on how we proceed with, with those um, in our church as well. Uh, just a reminder to those who are here in person with the health and safety protocols that we're following, please keep at least six feet of distance between you and others. Make sure that you keep your mask on during the service as much as possible. We'll have to take them off for communion, but other than that, please keep your mask on. Uh, we are not going to be singing again today, and when we do the responses, uh, the Lord's Prayer and the responses in the communion ritual, please do that quietly, but keep your mask on when, when you do those responses. If you have a prayer request that you'd like to share, if you write that out on one of the cards that's in the pews, and just lift that up. Uh, one of our ushers can get that from you and bring that up to me for our prayer time this morning. 
And then we are allowing use of the restrooms on this floor down the hallway, but please follow the protocols, open and close the door with a paper towel, and then make sure that you wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap and water after you've used the restroom. Uh, no fellowship time again today, and we are going to be taking communion. Um, those that are here in the service, it will be in the pews. You have your little communion cup and uh, juice cup with the bread. If you didn't get one of those, um, just let Judy know, and she can get one for you. And uh, those at home, please have your communion elements ready at home. And then we ask at the end of the service that you please wait until after you've left the building, wait till you're outside to have conversation with other people. Um, you can take your masks off when you get outside if you want to, but please wait till you get outside for that. Um, also, um, we had a church council meeting scheduled for this Thursday, but we are gonna cancel that meeting. Uh, we've had enough contact online that we don't think we need it right now. And uh, we are asking though that reports be submitted. If you have financial reports or other reports for church council, please get those in so that we can share those with the, with the council members. And then uh, thank you again for continuing to support our offerings. And uh, we do have offering plates throughout the sanctuary uh, for you to put offerings in. And then also the mission offering for this month is winter, winter coats for the PBL students. I know we're still in the middle of summer, but winter will be here before we know it. And we want them to be prepared well ahead of time for winter. So we'll be doing our uh, mission offering for that. And then our altar flowers for this morning. We have a slide for those. And our altar flowers are presented to the glory of God and in honor of mine and Judy's 37th anniversary, which is this Thursday, August 6th. And then the other altar flowers are given in honor of Rick and Ellen Byers' 43rd anniversary, which was back on May 28th, given by Scott Byer and Jeremiah Brandon and family. And uh, we're catching up on the flowers, so some of them are going to be still from back in May and June and even July until we get caught up. But uh, thank you for providing those flowers for our service. And uh, for, the, for the buyers, if you want those flowers and can let me know, we'll make arrangements to get those to you after the service today. Also, a reminder that we are doing our evening devotion times, and that's at 7.30 Monday through Friday on our Facebook page or by conference call. We invite you to join us. And Wednesday evening, we're doing Ask the Pastor, and now Thursday evening, we'll be doing a prayer, a prayer focus on Thursday. So I hope you can join us for, for those times especially. And I think uh, that's all the announcements that we need to make for this morning. So at this time, let's join together in our worship as we join, and I will, I will share the gathering words with us. In our darkest hours, God's light continues to shine. In our weakest moments, God's strength is enough. In our times of greatest challenge, God's presence is always near. Let us worship our great God. Would you please join your hearts with me in prayer? Loving and gracious God, we come together again this morning, still finding our way through this maze of confusion with COVID-19 and the challenges that it presents. We thank you that we have the technology to be able to connect with people beyond the doors of the church. And we thank you that we have people who are joining us for worship in the sanctuary. We ask your blessings and your guidance as we move forward in this service today. May your Holy Spirit be always with us and guide us in your ways. We give you praise and glory in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ and in the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Judy is going to come and share children's time with us this morning. And as she's coming, I do want to make one more announcement. We did get our new video system installed in the sanctuary this morning. So we are using the new video camera. And uh, we want feedback on that too, as to your experience, especially those that are on Facebook that are watching it on Facebook Live, as to the experience with the new technology that we're using. I'm glad you gave me a little bit of time to get over here. <laughs> um, okay, well guys, it's almost time for school to start. Did you know it's almost time to, for school to start? That doesn't seem like it's long, does it? Well, it is. And we're getting ready. Are you getting ready? Have you got your backpack yet? Have you got your backpack? I don't have a backpack. 
I still have to pack stuff for school, but I have a backpack. I have a zebra bag, which I forgot to bring this morning. There was something I forgot. And in my zebra bag, I have to put all the things that I'm going to need. When we get ready for new things, we have to get prepared. We have to pack everything up that we need. But you know, that reminds me of an old song that I remember singing a lot. It's part of, what did you tell me? Stand up, stand up, stand up for Jesus. And one line of it says, put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. We all need to put on our armor. We all need to get ready. We all need to be prepared for whatever it is that God asks us to do. And the first thing we have to do before we do anything else is to pray. Today, Pastor is going to tell us a story about a man named Nehemiah. And he was a cupbearer for the king of, I think, Persia, which was a very important job. It meant that the king expected him to taste everything that he was going to eat. You know this king had to know him pretty well and trust him pretty well. But Nehemiah was Jewish. And some friends of his came back from, is from Israel, and they said, Jerusalem's a mess. They've rebuilt some of their houses, but they haven't rebuilt the wall. They haven't rebuilt the temple. And Nehemiah said, we need to do this. Before he could do anything, he had to ask permission from the king. And before he went to ask permission from the king, he went to prayer. That was the very first thing he had to do. And we all need to learn to remember when we've got a new thing that we're looking at, we're not sure about, that we're worried about, we need to go to God in prayer first. So I'm going to say a prayer that we'll all learn to pray. How's that for a little different thing? Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for reminding us as we're preparing for new things, things that are a little bit different than we're used to, we can go to you in prayer. You already know what's ahead of us, and you already know how to make us victorious over everything in front of us. Thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to be our guide. Help us to remember to come to you first when we're starting something new. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're going to join together in our prayer time, and I have a few prayer requests that I want to lift up for us this morning. Uh, if you haven't joined us in our evening devotions, you may not be aware of all these things, but I want to share some updates. Um, Judy Hastings is continuing to recover from foot surgery. She had her stitches out this week, and everything's progressing well for her. Also, Hope Miller is continuing to recover from her hip surgery, and uh, she's begun therapy, and all's going well for her as well. And then uh, Martha Zimmerman, the mother of Terry Iyer and Ellen Lee, has been going through therapy after having a heart valve replacement surgery, and she's doing well, so we praise God for that. Um, Pat, I didn't get a chance to ask you. You can tell me later, okay? <laughs> um, also, uh, Hunter Crow and his girlfriend Emily that we've been praying for for about a month now uh, Hunter is at home doing outpatient therapy. Emily was moved up to a special facility in Chicago this week for rehab uh, for her type of injury, so we keep praying for them. And then Anne is with us this morning, uh, has shingles and still getting over those, so please keep her in prayer. Uh, Judy Hofer was up at Mayo this week um, getting some tests done for a, a leaky heart valve. And then I got an update on Dave Wells, which is the husband of Rosie Westerfield Wells, who's the cousin of Pastor Terry that used to serve our church here, and he had heart surgery back at the end of June and had some complications, but uh, Bonnie told me that he is back home now and doing well and recovering well, so thank you for your prayers for Dave. And then for those that are going through bouts with cancer, we continue to lift them up. Bonnie's niece, Jacqueline, um, and then Jacqueline's father, Jack, Bonnie said she hadn't heard anything recently about him, but he was also having some heart issues. And uh, Karen Marshall, the aunt of Amanda Gooden, who's starting chemotherapy. Uh, Lenny Hethke, a little three-month-old from Buckley that's being treated for leukemia at St. Jude's in Memphis. 
And then Lincoln Downing, we shared last week that the test came back and uh, everything was a go for him to be approved for a bone marrow transplant. And they're going to be at the hospital tomorrow for him to be admitted for that transplant. So keep praying for them that all goes well and that they can get him in for this bone marrow transplant as he's also dealing with a neuroblastoma uh, type of cancer. Um, Bob Evans is having some issues with his health and has a very swollen leg, and so I talked to Harriet this week, and they would appreciate our prayers. And then Bonnie Howard's sister-in-law, Monaco, we shared that her mother in Japan suffered a cerebral hemorrhage about two weeks ago, and uh, Bonnie says she doesn't have any updates at this point, but we're praying that Monaco can get over there to see her mother and also praying for healing for her mother and for Jesus to be real to her. And uh, we have uh, also John, John Mink, who's the brother of Terry Whitebird, had a stroke back in the middle of June, and uh, he's regained the use of his left hand and is making progress, but uh, he still has to use a wheelchair because his left leg isn't working as well. So uh, we're praying for him, for his recovery, and he also hopes to go back to work. The doctors are optimistic that if he continues with his therapy, he can go back to work in September. So keep praying for John. And then we have a couple of people in our church family who are uh, deployed. Uh, Spencer Ware, who is the son-in-law of Ellie White, is in Kuwait right now. And then Abram Whitebird, who's the nephew of Terry Whitebird, has also been deployed. So prayers for all of our young men and women in the military. And we have a number of uh, church members who've passed away in recent months, and we continue to keep them in prayer. But this week we learned of the death of Tilly Marshall, down in Florida, and I've been keeping in touch with Jamie, which is her granddaughter. Uh, They are bringing her back up here to Illinois for a service. It will be a graveside service at Glen Cemetery, but uh, don't know yet about uh, bringing other people to the cemetery for patient time. I'm waiting to hear on that. We'll send out an email from the church once we know for sure uh, for those people that knew Tilly that want to uh, pay respects to the family or know family members and want to pay respects. I lost a very good friend this week that passed away, a a fellow pastor that I'd worked with in Emmaus and Chrysalis for many years. Reverend Julie Asbell passed away, and I would ask your prayers for her husband, Randy, who's also a pastor, and for their family, and then uh, continued prayers for those church members who passed away. And uh, it's been a rough week for us. Uh, We lost two of our birds, uh, the two birds that we had within the last week and a half, Um, Artie passed away on the 23rd of July, and then Pip passed away just on Friday night on the 31st, so we're going through a rough struggle with the loss of uh, William's pet birds at this time, and I know other families have lost pets as well, so keep those people in your prayers. And then, of course, prayers for uh, Luke and Jamie Ulrich um, and uh, Charles and Destiny Magumba, who are missionaries. Uh, Charles and Destiny are in Rockford still and uh, staying with a retired pastor friend up there until uh, they hopefully can get arrangements made to return back to Uganda soon. Uh, So please keep that situation in your prayers. And I believe those are all the updates I have for this morning. So let's join our hearts in prayer as we go to the Lord together. Loving and gracious God, as we come before you this morning, we know that there is great need in our nation right now. We lift up our praises to you because you are a great and mighty God. And you are a God who loves people and uh, reaches out to us through your son, Jesus Christ. But we're living in a very fractured world, and we pray that you would forgive us of anything in our hearts and minds that might be contrary to your will. We pray, Lord, that you would guide us in reaching out to people who are of different races and uh, reaching out to people who have differences in opinion on things, that we can do so in kindness and uh, with love as we reach out to those around us. Lord, we pray for those that we've mentioned this morning that are in need of your healing in their lives, those recovering from recent surgeries, those who are facing surgeries coming up, and we especially pray for little Lincoln and for this bone marrow transplant that it goes well and that he will have your healing working in his body. Lord, uh, we pray for others that are battling cancer and pray for your your, uh, encouragement to them as well 
and uh, just uplift them and help them through this and bring the healing power into their bodies too, Lord. We pray for those that are struggling with the COVID-19 and, and uh, pray for our healthcare professionals, those that are on the front lines of this, but especially for the people that are going through this. And uh, we pray for the families of those who've lost loved ones in the midst of this pandemic. We pray for your guidance as we continue through this, that we may um, honor you and the ways that we approach other people and the ways that we interact with other people in this time. And Lord, be with our military personnel, keep them safe where they are, uh, especially those that are in our families or from our church family. Watch over them and keep them in your care until they complete their tour of duty and are able to return home to their families safely and give comfort to those who've lost loved ones on the battlefields around the world. And Lord, we pray that you would guide and direct us in our worship today, in our meeting that is coming up after the worship service. We pray for our hearts to be with your heart in all of this as we join together in worship and in prayer. And we just thank you, Lord, for your, your blessings in our lives today and every day as we lift our prayers to you in the strong and mighty name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and in the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. We have some special music this morning. And Andy Hudson is going to share a trumpet solo with us. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Thank you, Andy, for sharing that special music, and Judy for accompanying him. Our scripture lesson for this morning that Judy alluded to in the children's time is Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant. Hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. 
We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer to the king. Would you please join your hearts with me in prayer? Loving God, we thank you for these words of Nehemiah. Lord, they hit our hearts this morning as we think about the state of our nation right now. And we pray for your wisdom and guidance, and we pray for your Holy Spirit to be at work in this time, to guide my words to the hearts of your people, that together we may be uplifted, encouraged, and even challenged in our living for you. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't think there's any disagreement or doubt that our nation is in desperate need of sweeping revival right now. We are in desperate times with fighting against this COVID-19 pandemic and the racial tension that we're seeing in our nation, and we need revival. Somewhat like the one that happened back in 1857 preceding the Civil War, Jeremiah Lanfear, who was a young businessman in New York City, believed in the power of prayer and saw a great need. The nation was divided by slavery. Drunkenness was rampant. People were filled with fear and anxiety. Lanfear asked God, Lord, what would you have me to do? God led him to start a prayer meeting at noon on Fulton Street in the financial district of Manhattan so that other businessmen could come and pray. Out of a population of one million in New York City at that time, the first week that he had his prayer meeting, six people showed up to pray with him. And they were all half an hour late. But that didn't dissuade him. They decided to meet again the next week, and that week, 14 people showed up. The next week, there were 23, and then 40 the next week. And then they decided to move it to meeting every day because they saw that the need was so great in the city and in the nation. Within weeks, thousands of business leaders were meeting every day for prayer. God began moving powerfully throughout the nation as a result of those prayers, and revival broke out and began to spread across the United States, and it was estimated that one million people came to salvation in Jesus Christ out of a population of about 35 million at that time, including 10,000 conversions every week in New York City for a period of time. We need that in our land again today. How many of you believe that we need another revival like that in our nation? Let me just see see hands this morning. And how many of you believe that God could do that again? I do. And how many of you believe that God wants to do that again? I believe that as well. Well, how many of you are willing to do whatever God wants and needs of you in order to make that happen? If so... If we want it to happen, it has to begin with us in the churches, and it has to begin with prayer. I've always loved the book of Nehemiah, and over the next few weeks, I'm going to be sharing some messages about how God used Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He didn't do it without help, but when he heard about the deep trouble that the people of the city of Jerusalem were having, he felt that deep need, that holy discontent in his heart. 
The walls had been broken down, the gates had been burned, and but, but before Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem to carry out God's plan of rebuilding, he began with prayer. We are in a season of rebuilding. I've heard many people say during these last four months, including my ministry coach and mentor Nelson Searcy, that God was not surprised about any of this that has happened in our world today. God knew that the pandemic was coming and a time of national turmoil would break out with the racial unrest. This did not take God by surprise. He knew that churches would have to go online for many months and then slowly begin getting back together in the church buildings for corporate worship. And God knew that we would need to hear from him about how we would begin the process of rebuilding. He wants us to restore the church. He wants to rebuild and revive his people. And we need to hear from him and obey him and adjust our lives to his plans as he leads us through this time. Now, there are some people who still believe that revival is about reaching people outside the church who don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and getting them saved and bringing them into the life of the church. And part of that may be true, but the truth is that revival begins with the people who are already in the church. We have to be revived before we can reach out to the people around us. We need to seek God's heart and God's will for restoration and rebuilding and revival in our churches, but also in our land. And I believe that God wants to do this. I believe God wants to stir up his church in these tumultuous days that we're living in right now. God is showing us the depth and depravity of sin in our world today. The question for us is, will we realize that revival starts with us and begins with prayer? God is showing us our desperate need for him. The question for us today is, will we cry out to him in desperation in prayer? I just started using a book for our evening devotions titled Inside the Miracles of Jesus by Jessica Legrone. And she is uh, dean of the chapel at Asbury Theological Seminary. She shares that before every miracle that Jesus did, there was desperation in the lives of those who needed that miracle. I would say that our nation is in a state of desperation right now. God is showing us the direction we need to go, and we need to go to him in prayer and follow his leading. Nehemiah gives us insight in how to begin. Nehemiah is one of the history books of the Old Testament, and it along with the book of Ezra, by the way, Ezra and Nehemiah were originally one book in the Jewish scriptures, but it gives the account of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem and the magnificent temple that had been destroyed and burned by the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar in about 586 B.C. It was a tremendously desperate, traumatic, and tragic time for God's people. In those days, cities were surrounded by great walls to protect them from attacks of enemies. If the walls were broken down, the city would be extremely vulnerable to being attacked and overrun by their enemies. And when Nehemiah heard that the walls around Jerusalem were broken down, he knew that something had to be done. He had that holy discontent within him. He also knew that there would be opposition to the rebuilding because there were enemies around Jerusalem. He knew that it would take a huge amount of hard work, but he also knew that his God was a powerful God, and that made all the difference to him. And here's one more thing that's important for you to know. Nehemiah was a lay person. He was not a priest or a preacher or a prophet. He was a lay person in a secular job as cupbearer to the king. That was not a real prominent position, really. I mean, he had to taste all the stuff that came to the king to make sure that it wasn't poisoned before the king ate it. 
That's the way people lived back in those days, especially the rulers. So know this, when revival comes, it will come through the people of God's church. It's not something that the pastors and the preachers and the evangelists come up with just to try to, to manipulate the emotions of people, but rather it will come when the people in the pews, as well as the pastor in the pulpit, realize and prepare ourselves for God to move. When we put ourselves in the position to receive God's presence and passionately pray for revival that God wants to bring. If we truly desire to see revival, restoration, and rebuilding of God's church and the advancement of his kingdom, we must commit to praying regularly, consistently, and fervently. We learn from Nehemiah the great need of God's people. Why do we need to pray? Why do we need to cry out to God? That's the question we're asking. We need to get clarity on that so that we can pray specifically and passionately for God to bring revival. We need to honestly and clearly see the condition of the hearts of people and our own hearts so that we will understand the need to pray fervently. Nehemiah realized that he needed to pray because of the trouble that the people in Jerusalem were experiencing and the fact that the walls had been broken down. This was a desperate situation for the people. In the Hebrew, the word for trouble means misery, calamity, disaster, and that's what they were facing. So the bottom line is that the people of God inside the city of Jerusalem were in deep trouble, dangerously vulnerable to even more trouble due to the destruction of the walls and the gates. And you and I need to take a serious look at the conditions of our own hearts as well as the heart of our nation. Our hearts need to be broken with what breaks the heart of God. We must see how desperately we need the Lord, how desperately we need the revival that only God can bring. We won't be able to respond in the right way until we have clarity. And then and only then will we begin to respond to the Lord in the way that he desires. Nehemiah's response to the news of the broken down walls was not one of anger, or retaliation against the enemies that did this, or hostility. He didn't put together a group of vigilantes to go after the people that had done this. He didn't call a press conference and make a speech about the broken down walls. Look at what he did in response to the great need of his people. He sat down, he wept, he mourned for days, and he fasted and prayed. All of these are outward displays of the broken heart of a man. His response was one of brokenness. He was broken for the things that had broken the heart of God. And we need to get serious about prayer for revival in our land. Nehemiah's prayer to God wasn't some nonchalant, half-hearted prayer. It was a serious prayer, a desperate cry, a deep beseeching a depth of his heart appeal for God to act. Look at his prayer. It gives us a great pattern for getting serious about praying for revival in our lives and in our land. First, he recognized God for who he was, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. He remembered God's promises to his people. He requested God's response, and he revealed the heart of the problem and asked for God's favor in approaching the king to get permission to go back and rebuild the walls. Nehemiah in his prayer recalled how God had told Moses what was necessary to get right with the Lord. The necessary ingredient is to begin with prayers of repentance. There was no way that anything was going to happen until there was true repentance. And revival will never come until God's people begin that repentance of our own sins and wholeheartedly turn our hearts back to God. In a few minutes, we're going to share a prayer of repentance as we prepare to share Holy Communion together this morning. This prayer has always troubled me. And that's a good thing. 
because it convicts me and it fills me with that holy discontent. We pray in that prayer confessing that we have not loved God with our whole heart and we have failed to be an obedient church. And I know some people will object to that and say, oh, but we're being obedient. We're doing what's necessary to honor God in our church. But are we doing everything that we need to be doing? Are we doing it as well as we possibly can be doing? And then toward the end of that prayer, we pray, we have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Again, we think, well, we've reached out to people around us and helped them in times of need. But have we done it by God's direction in the way that God wants us to do it? Forgive us, God, we pray. Once a week, Dr. Timothy Tennant, who's the president of Asbury Theological Seminary, helps J.D. Walt by contributing to the daily devotion from Seedbed that I read every morning. And this week, Dr. Tennant convicted me when he wrote these words. As we are, are, as we are awakened to the delight of loving God, and the devotion of loving our neighbor, we invariably come back into touch with a holy discontent. Now, hear these words. It does not take long for our love for others to run thin, which brings us face to face with our own deficits. We must grow deeper and toward a greater surrender and dependence on God which in turn increases our delight in God, which then nourishes our love for others. End of quote. Throughout the scriptures, God's people have been called to repent before revival comes. We all know this verse well in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now, a lot of people, when they read that, say, well, this nation needs to humble themselves and pray, but what does it say if my people, God says? It starts with his people, it starts with us. And then Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 15, 19, if you repent, I will restore you that you may serve me. And Peter, speaking to the people of Israel in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, after the healing of the lame man, says, Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And then finally, James 4, 8, in the Phillips translation, says, Come close to God, and he will come close to you. Realize that you have sinned, and get your hands clean again, Realize that you have been disloyal and get your hearts made true once more. He was writing this to a group of Christians. A group of Christians, not to the people of the world. We have work to do for God's kingdom in this time. And we need to get to that work. We need to get busy in the rebuilding process. We must use the time we have right now to be doing God's work. And it begins with prayer. So first, we need to make sure our hearts are right with God. Are you willing to pray and ask God to forgive you if there's anything in your heart or life that might be keeping you from the relationship he desires? And then we need to ask God, like Jeremiah Lanfear did, Lord, what would you want me to do? So I have a challenge for us this morning, and this is on the attendance link in the Facebook page as well. Will you commit to join in a prayer time at 7.30 on Thursday evenings, either on Facebook Live or by conference call? And this is during our regular devotion time on Thursdays. I decided that rather than add an additional time in for prayer, we just use what we already are doing for our devotions. But join us for praying for revival, restoration, and rebuilding as we devote ourselves to God and seek to love and serve others in the world. Will you commit to joining us for that prayer time? If so, you can just type yes if you're on Facebook or you can put it in the attendance link and say yes. Or if you're here this morning, you can just raise a hand if you'll join us for that prayer time. Is there anybody here that'll join us in prayer time? There are some, good, okay, good. 
I hope that as we join together in submitting ourselves to God, humbling ourselves to pray with repentance and asking for forgiveness for our shortcomings and seeking God's face, that then God will hear from heaven, will forgive our sin, and will heal our land. Amen. And let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we thank you that you have called us to be your people in the world today in this process of rebuilding. And just as Jeremiah felt the holy discontent to go back to his people and rebuild the walls, help us to feel that holy discontent in our hearts as well as we begin this, this process of rebuilding in our church and rebuilding in our nation. For we need revival. And it begins with us and it begins with prayer. So help us to get focused in our prayers to you. Help us to focus our hearts on seeking your will and your way in this time. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In the mighty name of our Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now as we go to our service of Holy Communion, I'll invite you to watch the screen. And again, remember, if you're present with us in person in worship this morning, when we get to the responses in the Lord's Prayer, if you could just say those quietly under your masks, that would be greatly appreciated. So let's join together in the service of Holy Communion this morning. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let's join in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. 
By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we share in Holy Communion this morning, those who are here in person in the church, if you would get your little cup and bread and uh, tear off the little tab that has the bread in it first and take out your little piece of bread. And then those at home, uh, get your elements ready too as we share in Holy Communion together this morning. And yeah, you're going to have to take your masks off to, <laughs> to, to do this. This is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is broken for you. And the blood of our Lord Jesus poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Let's share in receiving Holy Communion together. And now let's join together in our prayer after receiving with your masks back on, please. <laughs> Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we come to the end of our service this morning, I just want to share a few reminders with you this morning. And uh, first of all, I want to remind you that we are going to continue our evening devotions. And Wednesday night is Ask the Pastor. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, please get those to me. And then Thursday night, we're going to start our prayer time this week. And so we hope that you will join us for that time as well. We also started a new Bible reading plan in the book of 1 Corinthians, and then we'll move into 2 Corinthians this month as well. That was in the newsletter that went out this uh, past week, but if you don't get the newsletter, there are copies of this available on the table over here where you picked up the, the worship order this morning if you want to take one of these with you this morning. And then uh, again, just thank you for continuing to reach out to our older neighbors and friends and encourage them during this time and show them our love um, I know I talked to uh, Bobby Pilcher this morning, and she says she still isn't able to get into the nursing home to see Larry, so they have to talk through the window still. So it's very difficult, especially for those people that are not able to get out right now. So thank you for reaching out to them. And remember, we have the uh, all-church meeting in just a few minutes following the service, so if you are part of our church and you want to stay for that, you're welcome to do so, um, and those that are online as well. And uh, others will probably be joining us online um, or on the phone in a few minutes as well. So with that, let's have our words of benediction. Lord, as we go forth today, we pray that you will guide us as you have in the past, that we will follow in the example of Nehemiah and be people of deep prayer, seeking you and crying out to you for revival in our hearts, in our land, in our churches Guide us, Lord, that we may honor you and that we may serve you faithfully each and every day. We go forth in the name, in the strong name of our Savior Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
morning, I just kind of want to give you an update uh, as far as the bell tower is concerned, but then also discuss um, the financial need of the tower uh, that is rather immediate uh, that we're kind of facing as well as status and those type of things. If you have questions throughout this, if you're on Facebook, please feel free uh, to type those in as a comment. You can also send Pastor a text message if you want. He just found that out. Uh, Andy is here as well. You can send him a text. Uh, Jason Bowen is here as well. So you can send him a text. Um, and we'll address him that way when we're finished. We will have a little Q&A if there are any questions. So the first thing I'd like to do this morning um, is go over a little bit of a timeline as it pertains to this bell tower. So, Jason, if you can flip that to the next slide. Okay. Can you hear me out there in Facebook land? Are they happy now, Judy? Okay. I don't know, we're waiting. So again, if you can hear us out there in uh, the stratosphere, let us know, please. <clears throat> but, um, Again, if you have questions as we go through this, please either send them to Pastor, you can send them to myself, you can send them to Andy. Um, you could also, if you would like, send them to like Jason Bowen, who is here. Um, but a timeline of events in um, 2012, 2011, 2012, the top seven feet of the tower were redone. Still no audio? Hey, William, how many are on Zoom? Is that better? Hello. Oh, perfect. All right. So 2012, the top seven feet of that tower were redone, um, as well as structural upgrades. It went from a wood framework to an all steel and concrete framework. March and April of 2019. William, why don't you just uh, close the Zoom? All right, we're going to try this again now. March and April 2019, um, we made contact with the contractor that did the work in 2012. Um, that was because we had already closed the tower and we had brick falling uh, from up top down to our main entrances. Obviously not an uh, ideal situation. Late spring, summer of 19, so a year ago, a little over a year ago, um, we had been in discussion with the insurance companies uh, we had been in, in discussion uh, with several engineers. End of the day, the uh, insurance company denied our claim on the tower. At that point, we had little choice. We hired an attorney to see what avenues we had. Um, three different engineering reports were completed um, on that tower. One of them, uh, the church hired engineers, and then two of them, two different insurance companies, brought in their own experts. Um, the end of the day that claim on the tower from the insurance was denied um, at that point we went into uh, a back and forth with the 2012 contractor as well as his insurance companies on the work uh, February of this year we um, entered 
for lack of a better term, settlement negotiations um, with the contractor and his insurance companies. Um, and at the end of all of that, we settled on $110,000. So we've received that check. That settlement is over. Um, to put that into a little bit of scope for you, in 2012, uh, it cost approximately 180000 to do the work. So we had $10,000 a year, basically, to look at the work that was done. So we, uh, we basically have lost um, $70,000 on that settlement. The reason for that is, and people say, why in the world would you settle at 110 for 180,000? Um, it has to do with uh, insurance laws and regulations in the great state of Illinois. Um, it also uh, has to do with the fact that the two insurance companies, had we gone to court, we would have spent another 50 to 80,000 um, on attorney fees. And likely in the first week, the, the two insurance companies would have walked away uh, free and clear. So. Uh, at which point there was a lot of concern on what would happen with the contractor as far as their obligation, ability to pay, things like that. So um, 110000 was a lot more than even the attorney thought we might end up with. So uh, we're actually pleased with that amount. Um, as we go into April 2020, we um, signed off to have a company called Midwest Restoration redo the top seven feet of the tower basically redo all the masonry that had been done in 2012. Uh, the only thing that they were not going to be redoing were the four corner uh, pyramids or pillars that are up there. Those were completely new in 12. Those were still fine, so those have been taken down but did not have to be redone. Uh, in July, uh, about a month ago right now, they began work, uh, and that is kind of when more problems became evident and were discovered. Uh, the hope is September of this year work will conclude. Uh, that is going to be very contingent on this meeting uh, and the results of the vote. So, so the top seven feet, um, I put that into uh, that red box there. And basically that is the top of the big columns all the way to the tip top of the tower. So if you envision the tower, if you're on the conference call, the big arches up top, you go from the very tip top of those all the way up to the top. That's the top seven feet. That's what was redone and what we basically had found when they went up there was spalling and checked and cracked brick, which is in that other picture there if you're on Facebook. Um, you can even see on that one brick in particular, this is an engineering picture, the entire face of a brick is off and laying on the ledge. So besides the inherent danger of that falling 100 plus feet on somebody's head, um, what we have found out is that lets moisture unimpeded into the actual brick. The only thing that keeps moisture, I guess, out of bricks is the face. So once that baked on face comes off, uh, rain hits it and just soaks right into the brick and gravity does the rest. Um, that work that we uh, had approved uh, was at a cost of $143,275. So that work has been approved uh, and is continuing. <coughs> The other thing uh, that was happening was some of the mortar up at the top was also starting to crack and um, pop off as well, which again allows a significant amount of moisture into the tower itself. Jason. The next thing we discovered um, was we didn't have any louvers that basically kept moisture out of the inside of the tower. There is drain work and plumbing in there. If you look at the south side of the tower, there's a four inch PVC pipe that runs along the outside of the tower. Um, that work, um, there was an option in 2012 to do that. The church um, elected not to, which um, was fine. The, the thing is, is we kind of knew the trustees going in and talking with the, uh, en the engineer that's still on site and working as well as the masons that we needed louvers up there to keep as much moisture out of the physical tower as possible. The louver estimate came in at about $27,000, which again was approved by the trustees. Um, the color of those when installed will basically match our entry doors. So they will be a very dark bronze, brown color. Um, if you look at the picture that's up there now, if you look at it from the street, it basically looks like you're looking into a black hole kind of anyway most of the time. Um, so there will not be much change, um, which will be nice. And if you do notice, uh, what you'll basically 
notice is some slats up there, kind of like um, sighting per se. So they're doing the eight big louvers or eight big arches up top. The other thing that they have done, the entire middle section of that tower, so from the round windows down to the three small arched windows in the midsection, we had an incredible amount of humidity and moisture buildup in there. Um, so they took out the center small arch window on both the east and the north side, uh, and those two arched windows will have louvers as well to allow ventilation in that entire center section. Uh, those windows are preserved, they are saved, um, they are in good shape. What we do with them is kind of uh, up in the air and for discussion, but you know, they, they were saved and are fine. The next thing that came up uh, was a little bit of a shock. So those very top pyramids were redone in 2012. Nobody knows for sure, but is guessing that the crown molding bases of those was also redone at that point. Um, and they were four pieces on each column, so we've got 16 pieces of stone. The mason was shocked as they started taking those pyramids off. They very quickly discovered that that um, crown molding, if you will, that basically holds those pyramids up was not a solid piece of stone. Um, they were four individual pieces, as I said, and on top of it, they were extremely narrow. So the entire weight of each one of those pyramids was sitting on that crown molding, which was sitting squarely, as you can see in that other picture, only on one layer of brick. Now you might say, why is that important? Well, every one of those pyramids, and you know, we got four of them, weighs about 5,600 pounds. So you've got 5,600 pounds that was sitting on basically um, one row of brick that's four inches wide. Were they concerned about them going anywhere? Mildly. I don't think a windstorm is going to blow those off. Um, they were more concerned about how can they safely put them up there and know they're not going to fall off in the meantime. Um, so what that meant was they came back with a bid to redo those brand new, the way they should be done. So they are one solid piece of limestone that looks identical to what we see now. Um, but it will sit up there square, cover the entire top, and then the pyramids will sit um, directly on top of that um, as they should be done. That as well was uh, approved for $8,200, and that's all four uh, of those. Then we got into an area, um, and I'm sure you can kind of go with this thought if you think back to how the tower looked even a year ago, and you looked up there, there was always kind of a line where the work had been done in 2012 um, and then where the work stopped. It was very obvious where there was you know original brick and new brick. Um, part of the reason for that was the original contractor did not mix the mortar color to match the older brick. Um, so that was obvious and then the brick was a little bit off like brick always is. So the contractor that we have now Midwest I mean is the utmost professional uh, and called me and said, hey, Greg, I want to throw this at you and the rest of the committee. Um, we had bid two, which is that square area, which is basically the top of the big arches all the way down to the bottom of those big arches. They originally had quoted that to us, um, and we were going to do it at some point at 31000 um, He said, we really think that that needs to be redone. Uh, it will also help blend in that old brick and new brick look even though we're matching that mortar um, and looking at it we don't think it's that bad compared to what we put in the original quote um, so we think we can do that for 20,000 even rather than 31. Um, so that email went out to the trustees uh, and was approved unanimously as well. Um, basically the the gist of that entire bid was uh, fix more spalled and cracking bricks um, and including a few of those up there in the actual arches themselves. And so that hit, um, and we had approved it. So then we were at 143. We were at the 20 for this. We were at the 27-ish for the louvers and the 8,000 up top. I mean, we were starting to talk about some serious money, and we had 110. Uh, and again, our original plan was before COVID hit to come to the congregation long ago and you know get as many donations as we could to fix the tower up and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and obviously, a lot of that change plans quickly when COVID hit. So um, this was discovered and then 
if we keep going, they got up and started fixing that area, and we found a mess. And I don't say that cheerfully. Um, basically what happened was they got into the arches and they started doing that bid two work that we approved for 20,000. And as soon as the grinder hit the mortar, the bricks just started literally falling off and falling apart. Um, you know, he, they called me and said, and this is like at two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, the head guy is named Donnie. Donnie says, Greg, he said, um, Larry and the crew just got back. And Donnie, uh, he said, Larry said, Donnie, we're done until we have an answer on, uh, you know, how to proceed. He said, because I'm literally sick of what just happened up there. Um, so the entire arch is on two sides. If you touch that mortar with a grinder, which you have to do to fix the brick, the bricks literally fall apart like dust. The face of them pops off. Um, and they basically disappear. So this is above and beyond the 20,000 um, that we just discussed. Four of the eight big arches need completely redone. So in the left picture there, the entire archway, they have to redone or redo. They're going to take out all three rows of those bricks there, and then the eyebrows, as we like to call them, the bricks that kind of protrude outwards. Um, that as you can see in the top left corner there of that left side picture is also cracked in half. Um, they have to take those out as well um, and do that work. So this work technically is not approved. Um, and I'll kind of get to what that means. It means that that's what it looks like right now if you haven't driven by the church lately. It looks like a mess. Um, the trustees haven't voted on it because we basically hit the brakes and said, you guys keep going with what you're doing, Masons, but we've got to have a pretty quick uh, congregational meeting to get this figured out. Um, so um, the other thing is the louvers um, are already in production, and they're obviously custom because not every church has the same archways. Um, one idea was, well, let's hold off on the louvers and we'll square those arches off potentially. And we're like, no, that'll change the entire aesthetic look, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then plus the louvers are in production. So we've got 27,000 or 28,000 already out there and the louvers being made. So um, we've got kind of a mess. So if, Jason, if you go to that next slide, we'll see if this works. Jason, can you make the sound down on this? or see if it's that, not on my mic, but on the slideshow. I don't know if it plays or not, but just a heads up. Just hit play, and then we can play with it if you want. What this is, this is a video. I took a nice little ride, thanks to Mike Jones. You can see that brick wiggling. That whole thing's going to come loose. Play by play with Greg. Point it back up, it'll eventually fall out anyways. Wow. And yeah, and these are bad. And what, so you think they just basically, what they do to these? They plastered. They, yeah, they, they did. right here, we just mortared it. Yeah. And grooved it, and then painted it. But it, like, that is, because you can knocking, see right here, because right back there, you can see the original brick, yeah, right? Yeah. So when you start knocking these out to repair them, Place That's them. how brittle it is. Yeah, see, they'll just... Dang. Oh, boy. So, what, what we discovered was, if you look right there at that image that's stuck there, at some point, and I don't know if this was 2012 or beforehand, I don't think anybody really knows, those bricks had problems, and somebody didn't fix it right. What somebody basically did was went up there with a grinder, and they ground out the mortar, they said, oh, all these brick faces are popping off. And they took mortar, and they basically made mortar look like bricks. And they got some red barn paint, and they painted it. I mean, that, that's about as honest as I can honestly be about it. And you could see in that video, um, the mason, we're up there in the boom lift together, and he's showing it to him, and he grabs one, and it literally falls off in his hand. And that's before he did anything. Um, 
So that is why this $39,000, it's not approved, but it needs to be. <laughs> we need to do something. Um, Jason, if you go to the next one. Then we get to this part. So bid number three that the trustees had envisioned earlier this spring and even last winter when we were looking over these bids was kind of a, oh, we can do this one in two, three, four years type of scenario. Um, well, then we started getting into all of these other issues. And it just, I mean, it started to snowball. And I guess if you've got a 100-year-old structure, uh, that kind of stuff can happen. But bid number three for the bottom half, which is the brick half, not the limestone half, is 42160 It needs to be done. It is not a factor in the tower opening, unless, of course, bricks start falling off of that, and then the, the main entrance will be closed again. Um, however, if we don't just move forward and finish this job right, to have Midwest or anybody else come back in two years, a year, six months, five years, ten years, I don't care, pick your timeline, is going to cost significantly more than when they're already on site doing it now. So um, it only makes sense to do this now. If you take it a step farther, when I was up there in the lift doing that video, on the way down, in that win round window in that center section on the left side, on the way down, there was a piece of limestone that we could see from up above was kind of hanging out, chipped off per se, but still attached. And it probably had a nice quarter inch to half inch gap that you could literally from the lift look straight down the tower and see it open. And it had just rained actually before I showed up to go up the lift that day. And that part was dry and right underneath that, that limestone, you could see where all the water had gone in the crack and out the bottom. On the way down, we stopped and I literally pulled off a chunk of the limestone around that round window. So um, that half of the tower is in significantly better shape than the top. However, uh, there is a structural crack on the southeast corner that they have found. Um, that structural crack actually goes all the way up the entire southeast corner all the way up to the top. There's kind of a prevailing thought, although unproven, that that's likely due to that nice crown molding and all that 5,600 pounds sitting in that one spot. Um, so the 42,000 on bid three, now is the time to do it, uh, just to be fiscally correct, at least in my mind. Um, you know, just get this tower done, get it done right, and then we can all smile and come back in our main entrances. So then we get to donations and the endowment. So originally, as I said earlier, we had planned to ask for donations and raise funds to help support the cost, uh, as well as have this meeting well, well before when we are now. Um, COVID, like I said, stopped all that in its tracks. Uh, we do still want to raise funds as people are able and willing. Um, considering everything going on. Um, I did actually have a conversation with Austin Curtis yesterday. And I said, Austin, I said, I'm just looking ahead. So if the congregation approves this spend, um, you know, donations might not come in tomorrow or in a week or two weeks or whatever. And he said, people can put money, earmark it or whatever, to put it right back in the endowment if they choose. He said it's not a, a closed fund. He said if somebody wants to make a donation that goes back into the endowment in the spirit of timeliness, they can do that. He said if they want a year market specific for Bell Tower in the near future, they can do that as well. So, um, and then I did put on a note because there does seem to be, and I put it in the letter I sent out to, um, and it's, it's not to cause, this microphone doesn't like me, it's not to cause irritation or angst or anything else, but they're just, since I joined the church, I think two years ago, um, and then got this lovely job as a trustee chairperson, there seems to be some, uh, a little bit of confusion or back and forth on, on the endowment itself. So I just literally quoted um, from Lorene Ostrom's um, will that says, I give the remaining two thirds of the net proceeds of my residuary estate to the United Methodist Church of Paxton, Paxton, Illinois, to be used for the restoration of the church 
currently, which was in 1997, known as the Restoration Trust, or be held as an endowment fund with the income to be used for maintenance and upkeep of the church building and the principal to be expended only upon a two-thirds vote of the congregation at a meeting called for that purpose. No part of this gift shall be used for air conditioning. Greg Newell's opinion only, because I haven't asked, but I have a microphone, so I'll give you my opinion only. She gave two-thirds of her estate for the restoration of this facility. It's 100 years old, plus. I, I didn't know Mrs. Ostrom. All I can say is, if you think of this church, besides stained glass windows, the only other thing you probably think of in your head is the bell tower. So um, I think she would be pleased to know we are spending this money if we vote to do so on the tower to get it right. So where are we at currently? Or what are our options? We currently, as I stand here right now, have a bill in my email for $110,000, which is the full amount of the settlement. So that money is gone whenever Denise writes the check. Um, we can pay that and be done. Uh, the entrances, the two entrances, will basically be closed indefinitely as a safety hazard, and work will stop immediately, and the tower will inevitably further deteriorate. Um, I will put one caveat in there. I reached out to our insurance company again uh, this week, and they came and looked. And I kind of got the same feeling I got a year ago. Oh, it is what it is, and we're not going to cover it. Then I sent another email off. And I said, keep in mind that you did pay a lightning strike damage claim on that tower about a year ago. So you have admitted that there was lightning that affected electronics in that tower. Could that or could that not have caused this damage in some way, shape, or form? I haven't heard back from that email. So who knows? Option two, we can proceed with all the work that needs to be done and make the entrance safe and reopened uh, with the use of funds from the Ostrom Endowment and donations. Um, I would throw in there that would also mean move forwarding, moving forward with bid number three uh, on the original proposal for the additional 42. Um, and would completely take care of the masonry work needed to be done. Um, off to the side there, there's a thing that's a graphic that Midwest had sent me. That total at the bottom, 238, 235, does not include that bid number three, the bottom half of the brickwork. So if you do that and you take off, if you add those amounts together um, and you take off the 110,000, we would basically need $170,400 uh, from the endowment if, if no gifts are received. Uh, obviously, any gifts that are received would either go back into the endowment uh, or cut from that total we would need to take from it. The other thing Austin and I discussed yesterday, the endowment itself is up right at about 299000 right now. Um, so there is money in it. Uh, like I said, it's about 299000 300000 um, right now today. Obviously, that fluctuates day to day. But... Um, that's kind of the thing, you know, you should have in your snail mailbox at home um, a letter that I'd sent out. You should also have some ballots for every member in the household. So uh, please get those in the mail tomorrow. Yes, that are, yeah, household that are members of the church. As pastor whispers in my ear to make sure, because all kids will not be voting. Uh, <laughs> so... Please make sure those get here by next Friday, and by here, that means don't mail them next Thursday because they won't be here. Um, so pray on it for a day or so if you need to, but then make sure, uh, calculate the mailman's time to get it to the church. Um, there is the trustee committee. If you have questions or want to reach out to one of them, myself, I put my own cell phone number down. So if you want to reach out to me directly today, tomorrow, or something and ask questions, feel free. Um, for those of you not looking at Facebook, my number is 217-417-2292. Uh, you can reach out to Jim Sherrill, the secretary, Mike Jones, Kim Evans, Scott Allen, Tad Ostendorf, Joy Carlson, Keith Carson, or Mike Pilcher as well. 
we'd be more than happy to help um, answer any questions you have. If one of them's not sure, they can reach out to myself or whoever. Um, happy to answer questions um, and get your feedback um, as needed. So at this point, um, if there's any questions, I would entertain them. All right, well, not having any. Is there any questions in here? No? Okay, so. Oh. Yes, one came up. Uh, Carol Knuckles would like to know, am I understanding correctly that any donations would be used to repay the fund? They could be used to repay the fund if the person wishes, or they could be specified for bell tower work it's donor donor which would mean less came out of the fund. which would mean less would come out of the fund okay um i got one from barb and i'll get that to you that information to you but it's not a question Yes, they are going to still work this week um, and keep kind of taking some stuff down. If the, the, the simple answer, answer, Joy, is if we vote this down, we will still owe them some money, but, but we will look, look at a mess for a very long time. So the answer to the uh, future projects, costly repairs, uh, you'll be happy to know that I uh, started out church council this year and said I don't see anything besides the bell tower. And that turned into a lift and some other things. Um, but uh, once the tower is done, about the only other thing that I am really aware of at the moment is some plaster work. We again have a nice roof leak, um, which would be when pastor is uh, giving the service off to his right shoulder above his right shoulder um, we think we've kind of figured out where that's coming from but um, with all the bell tower work and things going on we have not explored it too in depth um, the only other thing seems to be some kind of cosmetic we want to do these things but should we do these things like people continually talk about the dining room ceiling and and stuff like that but um, I, I think those are more wants than needs so I would certainly hope that once the tower is done, we are done with crazy major projects. It would not bother me if we were done with crazy major projects. Okay, Gary says it sounds like it is a safety factor that needs to be addressed. 
Yeah, without a doubt, it's a safety factor. Um, if I mean, it, in all seriousness, if the congregation does not want to spend this money, um, we will not have an option to reopen the main entrance, bell tower entrances. They will be permanently and definitely closed for safety. Lana wants to know, uh, has there been any conversation or discussion of an option to remove the tower? So we actually had a conversation to lower the tower, uh, to basically get rid of the top half of it, um, because we knew that would get rid of the quote unquote bad part. The cost to actually remove that due to the way the tower is uh, built was actually fifty to $75,000 as rough estimates more than to fix the tower. So to, to do that cost more than to fix it, which I know sounds a little shocking and frankly I think the trustees when we learned that in our meetings uh, were a little shocked as well that it has to do with all the inner workings and how the thing is built and constructed and this and that and the other thing. There was a, there was a question about the boiler. Has there been any problem with that? Well, whoever asked that, thank you for jinxing it. But uh, no, there has, not, uh, there has not been any problems with the boiler. Um, we hope that that will continue. And if not, we'll get some flex seal. So regarding the plaster crack, if you walk over to the parsonage and knock on pastor's door, you can stand on his front or back porch and look up there and probably see it. There is a spot directly above there where there is vinyl siding uh, that goes right into the roof line. Uh, and it appears from the tuck pointer that was working that uh, there's a significant lack of flashing. Um, maybe the shingles may be installed kind of backwards in that area, things like that. That's not a confirmed, but that's what it appears to be the issue. Okay, so from one of the trustees, they are having annual maintenance on the boiler now, so we think we're in good shape. I hope that's correct. So I don't know if there's any other questions, but as we kind of wrap up, Again, feel free to reach out to one of the trustees and you have the list of them there. Uh, you can send me a message or call me if you want. Again, it's 217-417-2292. Um, if you forget that, lose that, you can give Pastor a call and he'd more than happy to give you my number, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure Joy would be more than happy to give you uh, my cell phone number as well. Um, things like that. So. Um, you know, please think about it, uh, and then just make sure you get those ballots uh, filled out and in the mail. I would, I would say to be safe, you probably shouldn't have them in the mail any later than Tuesday. Um, so make sure you have them in the mail by Tuesday, unless you're going to personally drop it off at the church. Yeah, if you're going to drop it off, then have it here by, say, Friday morning, um, just to make sure your vote gets counted. So, again, I thank everybody. Um, and depending on this, I mean, we should have a beautiful bell tower that uh, lasts for generations and generations to come. So, and then looks the same. Thanks.